Hey, everybody, this is Roman and Brandon with Mixnology, an event series in L.A., New York, Chicago, and Virginia. Today we have a very special guest with us. Uh, we have TV director Joshua Butler, who has been directing for such shows as The Vampire Diaries, The Originals, Shadowhunters, Pretty Little Liars, and one of the most talked about seasons or shows this, this year is The Magicians. Everybody, welcome to Joshua Butler. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, very exciting. Hey, we have uh, with us Brandon as well, who's my um, co-founder of Mixology. Everybody say hi to Brandon. Hey, Brandon. Hey. Oh, no. There he is. Okay, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I'll say hi to Brandon. Uh, jo- Josh, this is going to be probably the most tedious question that you'll hear, but uh, because it is uh, 2017 now, we just ended 2016, we'd like to know what your favorite film of, of 2016 has been, and also maybe your favorite television show? Um, sure. That's an inter- yeah, I, I have several uh, favorites that, uh, that it's, I, I, it's hard to sort of think of which one if I had to, I guess Moonlight would be up there, uh, towards the top, La La Land I loved, um, and I actually loved 20th Century Women, not a lot of people have seen it, and it kind of got snubbed by the Oscars, but, but I thought it was sensational, um, and, uh, yeah, I haven't seen Fences yet, and, uh, and I'm very excited to see that, but, um, yeah, I, yeah, basically Moonlight and La La Land were the two movies that kind of just blew me out of my chair, um, and in terms of uh, TV, it's often difficult to stay up with with all, with all the TV. I, I'm, I'm working in TV so much that sometimes I, I just uh, you know fall behind on shows because sometimes it feels like work when I'm going home and watching TV. It seems like going to a movie theater I can actually like uh, you know let off some steam. <laughs> but uh, absolutely, uh, there was some, but there was some terrific TV uh, last year, and um, I mean I I'm I'm going to champion the magicians because I think it's. Uh, uh, one of the best shows on television right now, and I, I know ha- knowing all the intimate things about what's going to happen starting tonight uh, in season two, it's just it's an amazing season of television, and uh, I, I encourage everyone listening to, to to watch it. It's 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 unbelievable, um, and um, yeah, so so I'll go with that just to be uh, <laughs> to be self promoting for a moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, have fun tonight at the premiere. Uh, you know, best of luck. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. having we're all getting together and. Uh, yeah, you, know, you know, having some having some drinks, uh, break bill style. Yeah. So it'll be fun. Fun. What made you fall in love with entertainment in the first place? Um, were you from LA originally, or did you start somewhere else? And how did you end up in LA? Well, no, actually, I never even thought I would end up in LA. I grew up in New York, and um, I grew up on Long Island, just outside of the city. And um, I, I've said this uh, in print a few times, but uh, eight years old was when I decided to become a movie director it was like one of those crazy childhood dreams. I had a, uh, a an amazing birthday where I saw the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey um, directed by Stanley Kubrick, which um, for the millennials and Generation Z uh, out there, uh, those you should definitely check it out. It's uh, from 1968, but you'll be surprised when you take a look at it to see how uh, how it holds up, and especially in terms of uh, visual effects and special effects that uh, that Kubrick did. But it was just one of those movies that just transported me as a little kid to uh, to Jupiter, and I came out of the movie theater going, God, you know, that's what movies can do. I want to do that. And then uh, on the same day, I got a uh, video camera for my birthday, so I started to make films uh, or videos, I guess, um, through uh, junior high school and high school, and um, applied to one school and one school only, which was USC Film School, which uh, at the time was the one to go to. Um, it was either between NYU or USD, but um, as as often as a lot of people who are probably uh, listening know, there's, there's a world in which everybody ends up in Los Angeles to get their jobs uh, in the entertainment field. Um, I'd love to have gone to New New York and New York University and uh but all of my idols who went there like you know Spike Lee and Oliver Stone there they ended up moving to LA uh well uh, some of them did Spike Lee and I guess Martin Scorsese ended up uh being able to make it work in in New York but you know a lot of people had to 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 basically move to uh LA to get started so I thought I'd skip that part uh and just go right to LA and uh USC took me in as a 17 year old i was able to skip my senior year of high school um because i was in an early admissions program so i i kind of got uh got into it young I, at the time i was the youngest person who had ever gotten into usc film school i'm sure that record's been beaten by now but um but it was uh it was just a one sort of decision at eight years old that nobody ever really talked me out of and uh and then four years of film school later um you really realize how much you have to just sort of learn by uh by doing it and see where see where the industry and the path takes you. 
there you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Since we're talking about USC, uh, I'll go with like one of my favorite topics. I always like to talk about film school and everything. Uh, do you feel it's a necessary requirement for breaking into and succeeding in the uh, industry? I um, absolutely do not think it's essential. <laughs> I, I I don't want to be a, a Grinch when it comes to higher education. I think everybody should get educated. I think everybody should should uh, go to go to college, and I, I'm I'm all for higher learning. But um, my feelings about film school are uh, it's not that it was a waste of my time, but it was a very um, different experience than what I had anticipated. I had anticipated, um, you know, when you're spending that amount of money to go to a, uh, uh, an institution that has ties to the industry, I expected that, um, probably naively, that it was going to be a situation that they would prepare you for just kind of feeding you right into the industry. And um, I did the whole internal kind of uh, the hierarchy thing, you know, you, you, students compete to direct the senior thesis film, and I, they only pick four uh, people out of each class, uh, directing class, to do that. And you have to go through sort of a pitch process where they pretend that they're studio executives, they being the professors, and you go and you pitch them an idea and how you're going to do it and how you're going to shoot it. And, um, you know, I, I just, I just absolutely studied how, all the projects they were picking and I, I tailor made a project that I, I really thought they were going to pick and they did. So I did write and direct a, a student film my last semester. Um, and I thought that was my ticket. I really thought that was just going to, you know, then be shown around the industry and I'd, I'd get a feature and all was going to be well. And, you know, I could just say USC, USC, but the truth is the last day of school, they basically, sh there's a sort of a guidance counselor type of guy who sits down and, tells every single film student right before they graduate that USC actually um, can't actually help you get a job in the industry, that it's all about networking. And um, and that's it. Basically, they say, they say networking. And then you leave and you're like, wow, what did I just do for four years? I spent a lot of money. And basically, USC is saying, go, go make, you know, go find people to, uh, to network with. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a, there's a bit of a, <laughs> of a waking up period, but I look back and they were absolutely right. There's no, um, the, there's, there's, there's nothing that you can learn in film school that actually, um, applies to your uh, ability to actually get a job. Um, it, it comes through relationships now. I mean, if you're lucky during your time at film school, you will meet people and, 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 network uh with with industry professionals that's the sort of dream experience at film school but if you get get caught up in the sort of competition of it all it 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 doesn't really prepare you and um and in terms of actually going out onto a set and how to negotiate the people politics how to manipulate a, a situation you know and and get a team of people to trust you and like you and work uh, on your behalf and with you and how to do things like, you know, make a day. They give you 12 hours to shoot, you know, six pages in a script. How do you do that? It's, it's part math. It's part, um, people, uh, understanding people, understanding how fast things can happen. It's about giving space to actors who need the space. It's about, uh, collaboration, which is crucial to, uh, to make sure that everybody, everybody's voice is heard and you make people uh, feel like they're part of the process. All of that is is not not what I learned in film school, and and that may have been just my particular experience. But uh, I, I I don't mean to be bragging on USC. I mean there were a lot of <laughs> great things about USC that that I liked. But at the end of the day, I, I I have to be honest, and I have to before I say yeah yeah everybody goes to film school. I just I, I feel like especially in this day and age where it's so um, easy to make a film and make content, create content. You can shoot a film on your iPhone. I know that's a cliche now, but it's like you really can, and you really can go out there and create. And that's the way that you learn is by doing it, by actually going through the process. And then the way to get a job is by meeting people and, and, and developing relationships and maintaining relationships. So I feel like you can do that outside of a college setting. Um, and, and, you know, again, it's, it's almost like I wish in some ways I would have gone and, and gotten a degree in something else. And then, you know, like a, a, an education that would give me some life experience that, that I could bring to, uh, to the party. But, you know, I, I, again, film school was, was that way for me. Um, it could be great for some people, but, uh, 
but again, uh, I don't think it's 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 necessary, and especially for people that look at the uh, price tag of, of of a college like that and say that they can't afford it. Well, that doesn't you know mean that you're not just as qualified and just as as able to go out and get an industry job as anybody else. Okay, wow. So once you got out of uh, film school, what what were some of the early projects that really helped hone your craft before jumping into television? Yeah, it's it's um <clears throat> well, you know, I wrote and directed that short film that I that was shown at a bunch of festivals and I, I really again thought that that was my ticket naively. Um at the time I got a lot of high powered meetings with with executives who would say, "Oh, hey, great short film, come back when you have uh, made a feature." So it was like, you know, I raised my hand. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Isn't the short film supposed to prove to you that I'm actually talented enough to make a feature? I mean, it was sort of that odd moment in in history where where shorts really weren't <laughs> weren't getting anybody features anymore. And and I think it's pretty much stayed that way since since uh, my time post graduation. So uh, my my day job, I actually learned um, editing at uh, USC, and it was in the early days of Avid, which uh, was the machine that basically took over and revolutionized the post production industry. And I was lucky enough to get as my day job a bunch of editing gigs that. Um, Again, I just thought it was was a great way to make money while I was, you know, writing scripts and going out and showing my short and uh, developing projects in the usual kind of Hollywood sense, you know, trying to create those relationships, trying to uh, capitalize on my my film school degree in some way. And uh, I was it was an invaluable period of time when I learned how to edit, you know, uh, pretty much anything. I I was given jobs just because I knew the machine. So one week I'd be editing a home and garden television documentary the next week I'd be editing trailers for, for FX network. And the next week I'd be doing a, uh, a music video for Latin MTV. And the next week I'd be doing a, an independent documentary, um, one of which actually won Sundance uh, one year. And I sort of stumbled into these jobs based on my knowledge of the Avid. So um, that was, that was in fact what led me into my directing break because I found myself working for uh, a producer who was working uh, as his side job on a uh, USA Network series, and they needed uh, someone to take a new, fresh look at the pilot that they had shot uh, because they felt it wasn't working and they feel, felt that editorially it wasn't happening. So I, I'd said to them, well, why don't you give me the hardest scene in the episode to edit, and I'll go in over the weekend and edit it um, on spec for free. And if you like what I did, um, then you can hire me to re-edit the pilot. So I uh, went in over the weekend and um, it was kind of a surreal situation. I was in sort of in the lion's den because the editor who I was presumably going to replace owned the studio where all the footage was. So he was calling in kind of upset that I was <laughs> potentially going to take his job away. So it was, uh, you know, hashtag awkward, but it uh, I ended up, uh, you know, kind of uh, figuring out how to cut this very difficult footage into something really cool. And then so they that that was sort of what led to my directing break. And it wasn't the traditional way that I thought, you know, again, growing up, it was the whole idea that you would go to four years of film school, you know, kick ass, make a, uh, make a great short. And then Hollywood would be interested not only because of your short, but because you had a USC degree and, and you were, you were in the club. So, uh, I, I, I came to it in this completely different way. So there you go. You never know. And if you think, if you take a look at your resume, it's, it's cool. Cause we know a lot of, uh, Hopefully you don't get offended by this word, but YA. You get a lot of YA. Uh, yeah. No, I'm resume. totally not offended. I embrace the YA. I love the YA. Yeah. <laughs> is that on purpose? Like, did you go for those kind of those kind of uh, shows, or is that something that just fell in your lap? Um, it it fell in my lap, um, opportunity wise, um, and it just happened to be coinciding with the fact that I naturally respond to that type of material. I mean, I, I've always said that I feel like I'm in touch with my inner teenager and, and a lot of, a lot of my um, views of the world are still kind of uh, colored by, by everything that I felt as a teenager. And I really responded to um, like Kevin Williamson and, and Julie Plack when they were initially uh sort of conceiving the vampire diaries, you know, we, we kind of felt, felt that we were kindred spirits because you know, the, the epic emotion and epic sword that's used a lot, obviously, in, in YA. But the, there's, a, there's a reason for it. It's because, you know, when you're 
growing up, you have these incredibly intense feelings like, you know, someone you have a crush on, you know, it may or may not call you tonight. And, you know, you're, it's the biggest thing ever, you know, and you're sitting by the phone and you, you know, or you, you take an hour to, to find the courage to call somebody to ask them to, it's a homecoming and, you know, or you're, you know, you go to school and your friend is, you know, not your friend anymore. And, and, and that's, you might, you know, it, it feels like the end of the world. And, you know, it's like everything is, is really big. And I, I think that that's kind of what movies and television and music and art in general is, is designed to do. It's designed to evoke those big emotions in people. And, and I think, you know, music especially has a huge part of it as people who've seen my work know, but the idea is that you want to elevate scenes and you want to elevate uh, storylines, you want to elevate the narrative, you want to basically take people and say, okay, you know, let's, let's feel as deeply as possible about these situations. And I think YA at its, at its best is a genre that really knows how to do that. And it, you know, oftentimes cuts through the mythology of it. I mean, the, the mythology is fantastic, but the only way these mythologies work is if they're grounded and if, if the characters are relatable, even if they're vampires or werewolves or, um, you know, witches or demons or whatnot. They're, the, the, the idea is to make them feel like people that you, you know, can, uh, you know, identify with, empathize with, et cetera. So, so yeah, so in a way it's an accident because, you know, my entire career is an accident because it's sort <laughs> of like this led to this, led to this, led to this. You, you have very little control in the grand scheme of Hollywood over, over your life, unless you, unless you really, you know, create content and then just focus on that. But for me as a director for hire, uh, you know, entering the wild world of television where they rotate directors from show to show to show to show, you know, the, the concept of getting pigeonholed in a way uh, by, by being uh, someone who responds to YA material. It's not something that I am against in any way, shape or form. Cause I really love, I love the genre, you know, love it. Yeah. And just to clarify, for those who don't know, YA stands for young adult. So if you didn't get that, that's what it stands for. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you mentioned the rotating door. I it actually said leads to my next question, which is for television, directors go through the rotating door. It's never a single director for a single season. Um, I like to know what are the challenges in jumping in on, say, episode five or episode six, you know, some way mid-season, like you – Jump in on a show that's already established tone-wise, tonally, and mm -hmm. you know with its own style. What are the challenges in in being a TV director, being that there's a rotating door? Well, first of all, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, second of all, that is a question that I wish somebody had actually asked in film school. You know, because that is exactly the type of question that I think is so crucial for people to to uh, listen, you know, to look at, to, to answer, to figure out. And um, that's one criticism I'm going to lob at USC. It's like that kind of practical knowledge of what it takes to do what I'm about to tell you um, was not something that, that was offered there. So, so that's one thing about film school. It's like you have to, even if you go and if you, even if you have a great experience, this is very important information, I think, because episodic television directors, there's no, nobody who ever really goes into and understands the type of life that they're signing up for. It's, there's a, there's a sort of an, especially since um, it, the, there's a, there's a system of tax incentives, which I should probably put out there. And probably most people know this, that essentially um, for the last decade or so, um, Hollywood has decided that it's cheaper to shoot uh, TV series uh, in other cities other than Los Angeles, because places like, Vancouver, Toronto, and Canada, um, or even in the United States, uh, Atlanta, New York, New Orleans, Chicago. There's a lot of cities and states that have given uh, 30 to 40 percent tax breaks to productions that shoot in their state um, or, or their country. In, in, in the case of Canada, and of course in Canada, you actually have even more bang for your buck because your your our American dollar right now goes further in, in Canada than it does. So productions are basically um, taking you out of, out of town. And, and, um, basically when I get hired to direct a show, yeah, it's an interesting thing because I, I have to, of course, um, do my homework and basically watch every single show that leads up to the one I'm directing. I have to, um, read all the scripts. I have to learn the mythology of the world. Like I just directed the season hunter, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the upcoming season finale of shadow hunters, 
So I had to get up to speed on, you know, parabatize and uh, all the all the terms that that are in the Shadow Hunters universe and that 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 type of uh, thing. And I, I'm a good student; I can figure that stuff out. And, and of course, being a, a young adult uh, junkie that I am, I enjoy you know learning about those types of mythologies. So I I have conversations with the showrunners. And what's interesting to me is that it, it's like the the idea is that you're working within the parameters of what the show has already established, but what showrunners like to do, the reason they like to bring in directors and keep it fresh is because they, they basically do want my uh, filmmaking skill and they want my perspective and they want my sort of personal stamp on the episode I'm directing. I can't go in there and reinvent the wheel. I can't, you know, I, I, you know, my job is to make it look like, you know, the, the show you watched last week. I'm not, you can't, I can't just come in and, you know, change all the lighting and change all the, uh, the costumes and, and, you know, uh, the, the, the visual style, et cetera. But, but right. within the parameters of what's been set up, I have a lot of freedom and there's a lot that I can do filmmaking wise. And internally the showrunners really appreciate that and they want that and they want that sensibility. So I think that's why they do it. They rotate directors in to, to keep, keep the series fresh and to Absolutely. then have, episodes that they feel might be well suited for a particular director versus another director in terms of, you know, what they're looking for from a, from a, an overall perspective. So, um, but, but I, the reason I mentioned the tax incentives is because um, when I get hired to direct an, an hour of television, I think uh, it, most people don't realize it's, it, it's basically a month of my life. So I get, um, flown to another city. Um, I've done, well, 99% of the time I get flown to a city. Uh, I put up in a hotel for a month and basically it's a, about a week and a half of prep, about two weeks to shoot uh, a series and during, you know, weekdays basically. So, um, and then I come back to LA where post-production still takes place in LA. So then I spend a week with my editor um, and do a so-called director's cut and then that that cut of the episode goes to the producers and that's that's my process so every single hour of television you know it's just it's a month of my life so it's a, a big commitment especially since you're living your life on the road um most of the time but uh but the work is great and uh and it's and again i think it's important that's why i mentioned the film school thing it's important for people to realize that that's that's what episodic television directing is. And, uh, and you know, you, if you, if you're the type of person that likes to stay in one city for your entire life, uh, it's definitely not, uh, not going to be that. So that's, uh, I think that's worth putting out there. Wow. So after working on a uh, Netflix television, what's your thoughts on the accessibility of shows with companies like Netflix and Hulu that now allow for binge watching? Would you ever consider directing some shows? Oh yeah, I mean, I'd consider directing anything and everything. I I, uh, I think what what's interesting about binge watching is that it it definitely is changing the uh, the landscape um, of of how television shows get made because it used to be that we would be chasing air dates all the time that you know you'd have this air date and and shows you know the the old uh, you know the old adage work expands to fill the time so often shows were at the very last minute delivering their their final versions of episodes, they'd often be delivered, you know, an hour before they air. Now um, the schedules are for, for shows that are to be binged. You know, they want to make 10 or 13 all at once. Um, they're still doing the same model, you know, in terms of how to produce it. They're still overlapping directors. They're still, you know, doing it in the, you know, that same kind of schedule I had just mentioned, but um, they're doing it in, in, in enough of, advanced time that uh, that the the product is put out there in a different way and um i think i think it's a really good thing and i think it, it also is an inspiring um uh, uh television filmmaking to sort of move back to a kind of filmmaking per perspective where you would have less less directors you'd have more personal uh you know shows like you have shows like the oa um, which and Stranger Things, which were really two shows that were created by a very small group of people um, compared to the uh, to the network model, where or the studio network model, where you have you know probably forty or fifty voices in the equation. You know, in 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 shows like Stranger Things and the OA, you're really bringing it down to just a core group of very small amount of people who are writing, directing, um, acting in, creating the entire 
season and, and the episodes. And I think that's producing some really amazing results. Oh, that's another good answer for last year. Uh, Stranger Things, obviously, is a good there answer you go. for best, yeah. best show of last Fantastic year. Show. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Fantastic show. Although yeah. I, I, I still um, say The Magicians is worth, worth, there worth, you go. worth putting up there. Shameless plug, right? Um, yeah. I'd love to know, for, for the actors who are listening today, um, do TV directors have any say when it comes to casting for a particular episode? Say that you jump in on a episode in, a, in you know, mid-season. Can, uh, do you have any say when it comes to choosing an, an actor that, for a role that's in that particular episode? Yes, yeah, obviously I can't uh, recast a series lead because I, you know, <laughs> I have a different vision for that. But, um, yeah, yeah, for the uh, guest stars in, in the roles that uh, that I'm involved in casting, one interesting little moment in history, I, like just a little anecdote, was when I was involved in casting a gentleman named Stephen Amell as a um, guest star on one of my Vampire Diaries episodes. And uh, very, I don't know if people remember this, but uh, the episode where Stephen Amell was introduced, um, he had a sort of very uh, uh, limited resume at that time. And the character that we introduced, he played a werewolf. It was episode... Uh, 13 of season two. It was called Daddy Issues was the episode. And um, I uh, I loved working with Steven. I, I thought, wow, this guy's a star. Um, and he had a two episode arc. He got killed off in the next episode, but uh, he made such an impression on the CW executives um, from, from my episode uh, that uh, they eventually cast him as the lead in Arrow. So, you know, things like that. It's nice to, uh, as again, as a director to be involved, at least in 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 the uh, supporting cast because you never know you know things like that you'll you know you find people like that and you're like wow you know that's it, that's that's a fun part but yeah you know obviously in features you would be involved in casting everybody in the leads and everything but of course even there there's a lot of um, pressure to get names and quotes that would uh, sell international territories and um, so you know it's it's it, it, directors have uh, varying degrees of power when it comes to that but uh, it's nice it's nice when you have a voice in it there you go and uh you have correct me if i'm wrong you have two episodes coming up this season correct and magicians or do you have i do yeah yeah i have episodes five five and ten um my first one will be february 22nd um basically five weeks from tonight and my second episode will be march 29th and in the middle of that uh, the season finale of shadow hunters if people are watching that uh, my, my season finale is going to be on march 6th so, um, yeah, basically, uh, uh, those are those are the three episodes that are coming up that with my name on it. Very cool. Awesome, awesome. So, for those of you who don't know, Josh has his own company. It's called Ice Blink Films. Am I correct? Yeah, Ice Blink Films, yeah. Cool, cool. I, I'm just curious. Is there any significance towards the name? There is, yeah. Actually, um, I grew up uh, listening to – there, there was – yeah, I have to admit I had a goth phase. Uh, my inner goth <laughs> kid loved uh, a band uh, called uh, Cocteau Twins, and uh, a few people may may know or remember them. Again, millennials and Generation Z may not, but uh, anyone who was into you know The Cure when they were you know in disintegration years, et cetera, they you know that 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 era had. There was this amazing band called the Cocteau Twins, and one of their songs which was actually a hit in quotes on on um you know alternative radio was called ice blink luck and uh it, it stayed with me so um and ice blink is a great image it's the um haze that comes off of a field of ice in the antarctic that makes it look like there's kind of like a um a sort of a halo over the uh over the the water, so I thought it'd be a cool like visual if I put together a company logo, and then uh, and then of course I like the idea of uh, uh, if people know Ice Blink Luck, you know you know that uh, you know maybe I was kind of stacking the decks in my favor, you know <laughs> hopefully uh, maybe I could have a little bit of luck uh, somewhere along the way, so uh, that was, that was the, the reason for it. Very very cool man, and we have one more question before we hop into the Q and A for the audience. Um, this is kind of like picking babies, I know, but of all the shows you've directed, are there any particular favorite episodes? Um, any standouts to you? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I've, I'm asked that question a few times, and it, you know, it is hard to uh, pick your babies, but um, you know, one of the one of the sad things about being uh, a television director is that some of the best work that I feel like I've done 
has been on shows that got canceled, you know, and then they sort of disappear from the public consciousness and from the face of the earth, really. Um, some of them resurface on Netflix um, and people have to go out of their way to find them. But it's, oftentimes it's very frustrating for people because they get 10 episodes or 13 episodes and then it just stops, you know, abruptly. It's like most people don't know they're being canceled. So they create cliffhangers that then, you know, have <laughs> never really get addressed. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm champion. I champion a lot of the shows I've directed that, that actually um, I wish had gone because I would have loved to direct more episodes of them. So like a show called Reckless on CBS, which was a couple of summers ago. Um, I did a, I did an episode, episode seven of that show called Deep Waters, which to me is probably the best, one of the best hours of television I've directed and uh, State of Affairs with Katherine Heigl and um, Alfre Woodard for NBC. I did an episode for, uh, of that called Cry Havoc, which also I think was just really a, a great episode. Um, but in terms of the shows that I've, I've directed that that didn't get canceled. Um, I love the episode of The Magicians I directed in the first season. It was called Homecoming. Um, it was episode 10. It was a uh, uh, where Allison goes back home to her crazy parents and uh, I, it, uh, where Penny shows up in the Netherlands for the first time. It's a really, um, really cool episode, I think. And, um, and in terms of The Vampire Diaries, you know, I've done 11 of them and, and they're all like, my favorites in different ways, but, um, I, I, yeah, I keep thinking, which is the, my favorite, but, um, I would go back to, it's funny. I'd go back to daddy issues. That was a pretty damn good episode, episode uh, 13, <laughs> um, season two. And that same season, I also did Klaus. I introduced the character of Joseph, Joseph Morgan's character, Klaus, um, before he ended up spinning off into his own series <laughs> and doing pretty well himself uh you know uh, on the original um so uh, who knew that, that klaus was going to take off like that but yeah my episode klaus was really good episode 19 of there you season, go. but yeah so uh yeah it's 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 been it's been fun uh i i mean i hope people seek out the shows that uh that that didn't get a chance to to go further by a lot of networks i mean i think it's it's important to sort of keep the memory of certain really good shows alive so so i'll Absolutely. champion those as well very cool, man. Thank you so much for that. Cool. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the audience Q&A. Uh, if, if you ask a question, please limit this to one because it looks like you have so many people who want to ask questions. So first caller, Ben from L.A. Ben, if you can hear me, please unmute your call by pressing star. Did that work? Oh. Did it work? Oh. Hey, Ben, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hey, Ben. Welcome to the line. Uh, Thanks. You're on air. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Josh, for being here tonight. Um, my question for you is, is there any genre of television that you haven't done that you would want to do in the future? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, Ben. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for listening, by the way. Thanks for, thanks for uh, calling in. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would love to do a, um, a really kind of, uh, you know, emotional, um, drama like, you know, like This Is Us. You know, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but uh, my friend um, Yasu Tanita is actually the cinematographer on that show. Um, he I know and I Yasu. worked together on. <laughs> you, oh, you know Yasu? Hey! Yeah. You know Yasu. Great yeah. guy. Great guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and Yasu also shot a music video for me called Baby You're Like a Drug, which is. Uh, which is a cool music video we did together. And, and, we, but he shot state of affairs, that show I mentioned that was on NBC with Catherine Heigl. Um, so he, you know, called me <laughs> and said, hey, I'm doing this show called this is us. And uh, it's, you know, it's like, I, I get, you know, it's funny you're saying uh, Armand, the, uh, the idea of, 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 yeah. I mean, when you get pigeonholed to be the genre guy, you know, the, um, the, the person that, that does the, the sci-fi stuff or the, the fantasy stuff, uh, and or the young adult stuff. Uh, I love all that, but it also, I don't get a lot of calls to do shows that just involve people talking, you know, so I right. kind of wouldn't mind just doing shows like, you know, where, okay, no, there's no where vampires or werewolves or, or, or <laughs> magic or, or, you know, like, uh, crazy uh you know explosions or special effects you know I, I just there's something about just people talking so yeah i mean maybe someday i'll get a just a, a, a straightforward people just talk to each other kind of show all right thank you so much thanks ben awesome thank you so much ben up next we have Brittany myers 
Um, uh, find her call. Uh, Brittany, where'd you go? Uh, I gotta find her number. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hey, Brittany, can you hear me? Oh, I think we lost her. Hold on. Oh no. Okay, we'll go back to you, Brittany. Uh, we have Tony. Hello? Tony, can you hear me? Oh, Brittany. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hey, Brittany. Hi. Hi. My question for you, is it harder to get started or to keep going in the entertainment industry? And what was the particular thing you had to conquer? Wow, that's a great question, Brittany. Wow, that's that's getting very, uh, very philosophical. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I like it. Um, Thank you. I think it is harder to keep, keep it going. You know, it's like... Um, it's a life of per- what I say. It's like the life of permanent freelance, which is yet another thing that I don't think film school students are really prepared to really understand. It's like you're constantly your job. You get a job and then your job ends and then you are basically in some ways working harder to get your next job and to develop new opportunities for yourself and to keep keep it going and to keep a career going for years and decades. It's like the the luxury of of sort of falling into a job where you know a lot of people have jobs that last for 20 30 40 years they have their 401k and then they retire and then they you know they 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 play golf i mean that's that's a life that this is absolutely not it, it you're sacrificing so much um and i think um what was the second part of your question Brittany? you said that the uh um, like what was um, the particular thing you had to conquer what I had to conquer. Yeah. Well, I mean, staying in a philosophical zone, which I think is, is, is cool. Like your question is very, very much that I think, um, I think you have to conquer the fear of this job might be my last job. You know, the, the fear that momentum in life and in Hollywood will dry up and that you'll never work again. I mean, it, it sounds, it may sound like overly dramatic, but I think a lot of people, uh, struggle with that, you know, in this business, whether you're an actor or a director or anybody behind the camera, like you, you literally sometimes have this fear that you, the phone won't ring anymore or that your, your particular, uh, set of opportunities, which often seem very random and seem almost like, like, like coming out of nowhere, that those, those things are, um, are, are, are just somehow going to be taken away by the universe. And I think that's where you have to believe in your own talent and believe that what you have to say is valuable. So I think that's what I personally had to conquer, you know, the fear of what I was getting into, which was just, again, a life of having to constantly prove yourself over and over and over again and to stay with it, you know? So I think that's the key. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Up next, we have Tony from Biloxi. Hey, Hi. Can you hear me, Tony? Yes, I can. Hi. Hi. Wow, Biloxi. <laughs> Great. Actually, I'm actually I'm from Pasquish Jam, but my phone number is a Biloxi. Okay. Right oh, so. gotcha. That's your caller ID. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So I'm yeah. So I'm more so on the coast. Cool. But um, hi, Josh. It was so nice, so nice to um, get to ask you a question tonight, and thank you for taking the time to to speak to all of us. Oh no, um, thanks for calling in. It's been it's been so much fun. Thank you for having me. So um, yeah, what what uh, uh, what's on your mind? No problem. Um, my question for you is, um, who has been your I would say biggest inspiration since you've been in the entertainment industry? Um, a can it be a, a dead person or does it or only they living can, person? They can they can be dead, alive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I I have three I have three answers to that actually three answers I'll give you okay. three good answers to that. First one is uh, okay. Stanley Kubrick. Um, so you know uh, a lot of people who didn't grow up with his films, uh, you know, I encourage everyone to go and and seek out Stanley Kubrick if you don't know who I'm talking about, because he um, really revolutionized cinema in so many ways. And he's the reason I'm I'm on this phone call talking to you right now. If he hadn't made 
the films he's made uh, that that inspired me to to commit my entire life to this. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I it, it's just he's he's essential to to who I am as a as a as a person and a filmmaker. Um, second is I would say is is Barack Obama, and I know that might be again a very uh, obvious answer, but like um, Obama came into my life at a time when. I well, not, I don't know the man. I wish I did, but no. I mean, he came he came onto the scene when I had a very low point in my career. It was it was uh, right about the time when things were drying up for me, and I didn't know if I was going to work again. And I, I was very much hopeless and uh, in my mind. And Obama, through his campaign and his presidency. Uh, I don't know. He he basically just listening to him speak um, made me happy. Not only to be an American, but also somebody who who wanted to uh, wanted to achieve and wanted to keep going because uh, you know just the, the words he was speaking and 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 how he made me feel as a country as as a member as as a as a citizen of this country it was was it was outstanding. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna miss I miss that guy. Um, and the third one, most recently, I would say, is Lynn Manuel Miranda, who uh, you know spent four years of his life creating this little musical called Hamilton, uh, which a uh, few of you might have seen or heard of. <laughs> and it just—it's mind blowing. It just yeah. blew my mind. It basically, again, gave me, it just inspired me to uh, to to that realize that you know you can really do anything if you have an artistic vision. Like who knew that a history book lesson about um, Alexander Hamilton and uh, his his life would uh, would turn into the most uh, revolutionary and most profitable musical of all time. I mean, you know, wow! If that's possible, anything's possible. So, you know, and and he's just an absolute genius, and you know, wrote amazing music, lyrics, the the book, the 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 stage, everything about that show. Even as and I I got to see him in it uh, twice, which was amazing. So. Yeah, those are those are those are three people that I would stand by <laughs> saying, all right, you know, those three folks at various times in my life kind of got me through uh, and and made me pursue this crazy dream. Well, that's those are awesome answers. Thank you. So okay, much. good. Yeah, no, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, you really can't argue with those people. They're they're just yeah. I mean, you I can't. Can. You know, if I could if I could achieve one percent of what I, any of those three. Uh, have achieved, I would be, I would be a happy person. So. Exactly. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, Thanks, Tony. Next, we have Alex from LA. Alex, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Hey, Thank Alex. You. Hi, Josh. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for your time. And, oh, sure. Um, my question I love how Daddy Issues was one of your favorite experiences, and I think it's amazing what it did Thank for you. Steven's career. So um, you're welcome. So my question is, could you share more about that experience, and what are some tips and strategies that you can give aspiring actors to get noticed and reach that level of success? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it it's definitely I I feel. I feel I feel for actors because you know it's like I know it's again it's like an obvious statement but it's like acting you're you're being judged in so many unfair ways you know anybody who watches La La Land uh, which is a, again a phenomenal film if you haven't seen it you know knows the, the what what Emma's Emma Stone's character sort of goes through you know it's like that is so spot on and I'm the uh, you know the director behind the desk in a lot of those. Um, very awkward situations where you see people who really are trying and really want to come in and, and, um, and learn and, 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 you know, and, and not only make it big, but to really like to win the role. And I, I have, you know, you, you make, you're getting judged on all these things that you have no control over. You, you obviously would know that uh, as an actor, but um, I think the key is to be, um, and I hate to say it this way, but it's like, there's sort of an art of seduction involved. It's like, Going in and again being a cliche, maybe there's a reason for it. If you don't want the job, if you appear that you don't want it, or it's it's not that you're um, being standoffish, but it's like you to walk in with any air of desperation is not a good thing. To air, to walk in with any 
sort of sense of like overdoing it, like being too chatty with the, with the people behind the desk with, you know, with coming in with some sort of, um, with five questions about the, about the, the sides that, you know, like I, I, I can say with pretty much a hundred percent accuracy that, um, most people don't want to hear those questions. They don't, they don't really want to hear them. They don't really want to know that you're eager to get the part because that's sort of obvious. So if you just find your Zen and you find your, you do the best you can, you learn your lines, you come in. And that's another thing I think, be off book if you can. I know sometimes you get the sides five minutes before you have to go to the audition, but it's very impressive if you're off book. If you, if you can just come in, you know your lines, you come in, you're just very, already get into the zone when you walk in the room. I think even less like hellos, how are you? Because if, if, if we feel, I think, behind the desk or on the couch that you're already getting in the zone and you're already just there to perform and you relax into it and there's not any sense of you really wanting it or really not wanting it or any of that, you just, you are the character, you do the best you can and then you're nice about it and you let it go. But that's how people really, I think, get the jobs most of the time. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I know it's kind of counterintuitive because you're probably terrified and nervous. And it's just, there's any way to find a way to, to, to keep that to yourself, put it aside or, you know, use it in the scene if, if, it, if it warrants it. But uh, yeah, just, just, just be chill, you know? Don't, don't ask a lot of questions about the material unless there's one really important thing that, that will infect your performance. You know, don't, you know, say hello, but don't say, hey, how are you? How's your day? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, keep it simple. Keep it, keep it cool and just do it, you know? Thank you. That's really great advice. And I wrote it all down. I appreciate your time. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I, I just, yeah. I mean, that's just my my sense of it from my, my, when I, when I'm in casting, um, other people might tell you differently, but I, but I think it's, I think it's a, a very, very important to, uh, to, to, to not look like you, you really want it or need it <laughs> in, in, in right. a strange way. Yeah. That makes, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Thank cool. you so much. Thanks, uh, uh, up next, we have Robbie from California. Welcome to the show, Robbie. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Robbie. Yay. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank Uh, you for calling in. So my question, uh, I'm told a lot of loopers on TV shows like Pretty Little Liars and Vampire Diaries are must hires uh, as opposed to being with the loop groups. Um, Can you suggest any ways a person can become a must hire for something like that? Um, I don't know. Be the wife of the uh, the showrunner. <laughs> um, no, I, I'll work uh, on that. Be, yeah, yeah. I should be the uh, be the son of the uh, of the lead a- actor who always wanted to be in show business. I, you know, I, I I mean, not to be not to be crass about it, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times it, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. Um, I, I, I don't know. Is your, is your aspiration to be a, a voiceover or in a loop group? Is that, is that your goal? Yes. Yes, it is. And your and so. from your perspective, you think the must hire is, is the way in or. Well, no, I I've done, I've been very fortunate enough to do uh, some looping for a couple of the loop groups, loop to loop, uh, the loop squad. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, most of that has been for movies, uh, and the information that I have is that TV shows, which are uh, a more consistent source of work, tend to be more uh, must-hires. And I enjoy TV. I would like to be working within that realm. Uh, well, he, well, here's here, here's a thought. Um, I, you know, it's it's the type of thing where everybody's listening for something distinctive and unique. And whatever it is that you have that's unique about you and your voice, um, I just I would encourage you to maybe look at other ways of showcasing that. You know, I mean, in terms of more, like, do you have a voiceover demo? Do you have a you know like a other other 
pursuits in terms of like, are you looking uh, for voiceover work outside of, of being in a loop group as well? Yes, I have uh, a couple of demos, um, a couple of regional agents. Um, uh, okay, good. Yeah, well, well, I think that's a, I think that's a very good thing. I mean, in terms of how to be, become a must hire, I, I, you know, honestly, I, I've seen a lot of different reasonings for it, and and a lot of it has to do with relationships, and a lot of it has to do with you know um, certain needs. But I, I think the more distinct you you are, the more varied your your work is. And you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are voiceover uh, actors and uh, you know if you get a good representation and you get out there and you get a real I, I mean you might also consider you know doing a podcast or doing a uh, uh, you know starting some kind of a uh, uh, you know a, 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 a chat show or something where where you are becoming known as for your voice and your voice becomes something that is 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 uh, obvious to people who then might ultimately hire you for a loop group. You know, it's like it's finding something where they want your thing, that thing that you do. So I think it's finding that thing and then trying to showcase that in some kind of a unique way. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Robbie. Uh, um, let's do... Hey, Josh, are you, are you good for another 10 minutes or so, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. If people are still hanging awesome. on, I'm happy to talk Very to Very cool. We have Julian from Norfolk, Virginia. Julian, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, Perfect. I can. How are you doing, Julian? Doing well. Thank you so much for your time and your insights thus far, Josh. It's really a pleasure. Oh, sure. Thanks, Julian, for calling in. Appreciate you listening. I wanted to know if you could speak to uh, what separates a merely good director from a truly great one. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that a merely good director um, a allows for a lot of other people. And the, like, there's there's a fine line. Let me let me say it this way. There's a fine line between being a director with a vision who basically is able to then um, transmit the vision and incorporate the vision into um, the work that they're doing and um, mm -hmm collaborate with people to help them execute their vision. And one of the ways to do that is to, um, as I said earlier, I think really great directors, what they'll do is they'll open up the floor. The, like great ideas can come from anybody. You know, you want mm -hmm. to um, have your, anybody feel, you know, and the, the cliche is that the craft service person might have a great, great idea and you want to listen to them. And sometimes they do, but like, you're talking about your cinematographer, you're talking about your first assistant director, you're talking about your production designer, you're talking about, you know, your uh, camera operators. I mean, everyone. Now, the best way to do it is to, if you have an idea about something, instead of you saying, this is my idea, the best way to, to sort of convey that, I think, is to make someone else think that it's their idea, you know, <laughs> so that they feel, you know, so they they sort of feel like they're part of the process. And I don't mean that to be, to sound cynical. I mean, I think it's basically like it allows for people to feel like they have a voice and they can come to you with ideas and then you can decide whether or not, you know, that idea is, is, is worth, uh, you know, is better than your, your idea or not. And I think that um, it, it's an interesting dance that you have to do. There's a lot of manipulation, certainly not not evil manipulation, but there's a lot of you know <laughs> ways of making sure that people, you know, a lot of people need their egos massaged in certain ways. A lot of people need their, you know, need you to be a therapist as a director, need you to be a, um, a, a you know, a taskmaster sometimes, need you to be a, a, a cheerleader, need you to be a, you know, someone who's, you know, everybody needs something. And, and, and so I think you have to be empathetic to other human beings. And I think that navigating that is, is what makes somebody great. That said, um, there's, you can go too far, like the, the merely good directors that, that basically let the cinematographer set up the shot uh, without, you know, having any input, let the actors direct themselves and, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, let the, production designer just design every set and you walk in and then everything's great and you say 
after each take, cut, oh, everybody's wonderful, you're all wonderful, let's do one more for safety. And then <laughs> that, that, that to me is a good director, a merely good director, because here's the secret, actors do want to be directed. You know, cinematographers do want to collaborate right. on shot design, so to, as can cinema, uh, camera operators as well. They want to be your partner, they want to be, they want to mm-hmm. know what you're thinking, and then they'll bring ideas that, again, sometimes are just as good as yours or better, um, and then you give them 100% credit for it because there's no, there's you're not losing anything unless you know as long as your ego's out of the game, um, but you still maintain that you're the ultimate say in terms of what you know what you know you're going to be the ultimate arbiter of you know what idea gets you know wins then mm-hmm. it's a uh, it's 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 a very interesting dance. So, um, but I think the great directors don't have an ego that they're constantly trying to prove that, you know, they're, they're a taskmaster that, that is, you know, intent on just getting everybody to do what they've already pre-planned that, that to me is not a great director. And also on the other side of this equation, as I said, any, a director who is a pushover and says, Hey, everybody just do great work and I'll be here cheerleading. That's, that's also (laughs) both, both of those things are, are problems. You have to find the middle ground. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Julian. Up next, we have, it looks like Christina from Washington. Christina, can you hear us? I can hear you. Hey, how are you doing today? Good. Uh, Just taking our questions, Josh. Um, I feel like my question is pretty much answered. Um, It's about casting, but I have a second part of it. Um, So the first part was when you're casting a role, what do you look for? Which pretty much answered. Um, but what advice would you give to someone who would want to get on one of the shows that you direct? Um, in, in, in terms of, I'm sorry, in terms of like, like w- when I meet them in, in, in real life or in, in, in the context of the casting? Um, oh, in uh, casting room. and and just the process and like how to go about um, maybe getting into that niche of television. Oh, you mean, yeah. So, well, that's, yeah, the, the, the interesting thing, I think, is that right now, because of my life being in hotel rooms across the country, I'm finding that most of the TV shows are casting all of the non-series regular roles, or most of them, out of the individual markets where they're being uh, shot. shot. So, so, for example, anyone, I encourage everybody to go to Atlanta uh for example if you're if you're interested in building up your resume because like shows like the vampire diaries which are on their eighth season and the originals you know on their fifth season and and the walking dead which is on what season seven i think and like there's all these shows that have gone through so much local talent and of course if you think about shows like that that go on for years and years once they use a local actor for a role they can't use them anymore because they've already been established in the in the series so like going to a place like Atlanta or if you had any sort of uh, Canadian citizenship, you'd go to Vancouver or Toronto um, or Chicago, you know, now the Chicago Fire, Chicago PD, Chicago Medical, like there's so much going on in Chicago. They're desperate for actors. Um, even New York City, which has great tax incentives, is a great place for an actor for a lot of reasons, because obviously, obviously also theater, the theater scene, which is booming. But I think the 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 cliche of being an aspiring actor and moving to Los Angeles has has shifted because I think a lot of actors come to LA and then all of a sudden the work is going elsewhere and they're not, unless they're of a certain caliber, they're not going to be flown to the city where the show is being shot and paid for because that costs the studios more money. So it's better to be like the best local you possibly can, what they call local hire, so, you know, if that if you put yourself as, a, as, a, as, a, as an actor in, in one of those markets, I think that that would allow you to build up your resume a lot faster than if you came to L.A. Um, so that's what I, I tell a lot of people that I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of, yeah. I think, a good strategy mm-hmm. for it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Christina. Up next, we have Mike from Minnesota. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, Mike. Um, so you kind of talked about this a little bit with actors, but as a director for many TV series, 
do you actually have a crew, specifically like DPs, camera operators that you use in your shows, or is that kind of already set up prior by the studio? And if so, like what qualifications or styles do you look for in a cinematographer? Um, yeah, to you all, your first answer is is yes. Um, I usually inherit uh, the DP the same way I would inherit the uh, the series regulars, and I inherit you know the line producer. I, I'd inherit pretty much all of the crew. I mean, I guess let's put it this way: I inherit the entire crew and cast, except for the um, guest stars in the episode I'm directing. Pretty much everything else has been predetermined. So. Okay, um, cool. From that perspective, it is good to be able to work with a whole different type types of personalities and a whole different types of uh, of, of people. And, and especially with cinematographers, it's it, it's good to then know how to communicate with cinematographers um, specifically in terms of the look you want. You have to be able to, you know, it's like speaking the language. It's like being able to direct actors. You want to know how to talk to an actor after a take. Same way with a cinematographer, you want to be able to know enough about light and know enough to um, to, to really communicate what, what you're looking for. And oftentimes they're, that's a great relationship to establish because uh, they've usually already established many kind of visual um, tropes and ideas that, 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 that are already in the series. So you learn to sort of play in that, in that sandbox. But, um, but in terms of what I look for in a DP, uh, at this point, TV is being shot so damn quickly. Like you would not believe it is like, it's gotten so the, the the scripts are getting more ambitious and yet the schedules, the hours and the, and the budgets are not changing. So like I'm, I have to walk in, I'm doing a seven or an eight page day um, and half the pages are sometimes action or big special effects. And I want a DP who's going to light fast and well and not be precious and not be constantly going in and tweaking things and, and restricting me as a director. Like I get that, Basically, the, the cliche in television, which is true, you have to basically shoot in two directions. You have to block scenes so that you're, you're only lighting two, two directions as opposed to, you know, three or four, which you don't right. have time to do. But beyond that, um, even within the parameters of that, you know, it's got to be about um, as fast as you can getting light on, on a situation and understanding that, that it's got to be pretty, but at the end of the day, you know, we have so much, so many tools in, in color timing and, and, and the, the amazing what's happened in the last, you know, 20 years of post-production with the Da Vinci and, and the way that colorists can actually really come in and, and, and help. So I think DPs now have to know what they can do in color versus what they have to spend time doing on, on sets. Cause that's the worst thing is when a DP starts tweaking things and it takes 45 minutes to, uh, to light a shot and then I've lost, you know, time in my day and I don't get as many shots that, that, that I want, you know, so that, that I think is very crucial. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. You bet. Thank you, Mike. Up next, we have Andrea from California. Andrea, you're on the line. Hello, Andrea. Can you hear us? Hey, Hello. Armand. Oh, hey. Hi. Hey, hey. how are you? <laughs> Hi, Andrea, how are you hey. doing? Hey, Josh, how are you doing? Good, how are you, Andrea? I'm doing really, really great. I have a question for you from one of my um, one of my students, actually, in my class. You couldn't attend this um, this meeting, but um, let me see if I can find it for you. Okay. What? Uh, what? What? Can you just tell me what what uh, age group we're talking about? And uh, yeah, um, I, so everyone in my class is a, a millennial, so they're you know, roughly around 18 to about 29. Cool. And what, um, and what, and what do you, what do you teach? I teach millennials how to get into the entertainment industry. Oh, nice. Nice. There you go. Yeah, definitely. I may have, so, just, I may have just, I may have just accepted your friend request on Facebook. I believe somehow this you is did. now. Yeah. This you is did. actually coming back to me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> now we actually get to talk on the phone. On the phone, yeah, no, because I I remember that was your description <laughs> in your uh, in your profile, <laughs> helping millennials get into the entertainment business. So there, that's good. I know. Well, well, hello. Um, Hi. <laughs> so, anyway, so the question that he wanted to ask was, as a director, how do you find the perfect editor for your project when each one can be so different from the other? <laughs> that's a great great question. Um, 
I'll answer it in two ways. The first is the episodic television answer, which is that um, similar to what I just told the last fellow, um, you inherit pretty much everything uh, as a director, as I said, with the exception of like the guest stars. Um, so I am assigned an editor who is usually, there is usually for a TV series, there are three rotating editors and it's almost like luck of the draw. So I get it. I just basically mm -hmm. get an editor who, who would have edited episode blank anyway, regardless of whether I directed it or not. They, they're, you know, so I uh, think it's important. Um, I'll answer the question directly next, but I think it's important in that situation to be what I like to call an editor proof director in the sense that I want to make sure that I do all my homework and get all the shots and have a shot design and have a plan that I know what I meant to do because um, if a lot of directors just kind of throw the camera around and they're all into this sort of, oh, it's an edgy, energetic style and they just like to throw cameras on people's shoulders and run around and not really rehearse. And then they basically then, um, I, I don't I don't think that those are editor proof directors because then what they're doing is they're relying on editors, uh, most of whom they don't they don't have a choice in the matter of right. to hire. They rely on those editors to basically make sense of their footage. And if you get a great editor, great, because then they've turned your sort of messy kind of um, no plan. Uh, <laughs> so spontaneous. Uh, shooting style into something that's kinetic and energetic, or if they're not so um, talented, then they will just be in a, in a mess and you'll be in a mess because you'll be in the editing room, just, you know, trying to figure it out because you didn't have a plan to begin with. So that's, that's yeah. one way of looking at it. The second uh, answer, which is, which is the answer I think your, 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 uh, your students wanting, um, if you have the ability to hire an editor, um, like on the short films I've directed, like on uh, the music videos I've directed, like on uh, uh, some of the films I did for television and uh, uh, this horror film I made for the internet, like when I have the ability to hire an editor, I look for, um, I, I, I think it's, it's hard to interview an editor. It's hard. You, know, you, look at their, mm -hmm. you look at their work and you look and you see, but I think what it is is basically like, there's something about uh, having a, a, a reel where they've done something. And even if they have to go out and work on a, you know, a low budget indie or, or do a, a, a you know, sh a, a short film, a student short film, even whatever it is, I, I, I can mm -hmm. tell that there's a, there's a knowledge, there's kind of a spidey sense that good editors have about how to put shots together and how to, how to make performances look look good and how to create a pace and a style and a mood in terms of their, um, and in this day and age, somebody who's aspiring to be an editor needs to be able to do all of that, but also needs to be able to um, put a temp soundtrack in, to put temporary sound effects in. Like all editors are pretty much asked to deliver in their so-called rough cuts, something that looks and feels like a finished product. So you really okay. can't, you, you've, you've got to just basically put, make it look and feel like the real thing. And with the technology we have, we have the ability to do that. But that implies that you're, an editor has, has good musical taste and has good sense of, of you know, sound, of basic, of basic sound mixing and basic sound design. And also, you know, performances are important because sometimes you can tell that the actors were just not great and there was nothing you could do. But the best editors are also people where I can tell that the performances aren't weren't there on set and I saw how the editor protected those actors I mean I can tell all that from looking at the work so um mm -hmm. and ideally you know you get along in some degree of but but oftentimes you don't really need to get along <laughs> you know you, yeah. you, you're just you can be very casual and cordial as long as you're speaking the language of cinema to each other as long as they know what you want to do and what you want to achieve but um but yeah this is not a world in which an editor can can just kind of like they have to dazzle. They have to dazzle even in their, their temp cuts. There's, there's no such thing as a rough cut anymore. Just always, Absolutely. always make it great. Absolutely. No, I have to agree with you on that because, um, you know, I think it's important for a lot of the editors nowadays to really understand the direction of an actor. So they should probably take classes, um, you yes. know, to yes. understand, you know, the movements. And, um, you know, like if there's a fighting scene, which I know you guys have a lot of fighting scenes in Vampire Diaries too, so they have yeah. to know – how to edit that properly as well, right? 
Well, yeah, I, I just, as I said, I just did a show called Shadow Hunters, and and there, there's, you know, probably 20 minutes of of my episode involved some action, and and it's like, the, and and the other 25 minutes involved big emotion, you know. So it's like to have an editor who can handle performance and handle putting together really emotional performances, you know, with 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 good actors and making them look look great. And then also how to cut action, which is a whole different skill set, as you point out. It's like you you really have to know how to do it all because there's there's no world in which people will you'll you'll be able to sustain a career where you're never going to have to cut action or you're never going to have to cut you know really good performances or you're never going to have to cut in some cases um, you know you're never going to have to protect an actor in an editing room. I mean that that in and of itself is True. a skill set. You know <laughs> that how is do you how do you fix it? You know, and a lot of editors make a huge mistake when they get subpar footage um, in an editing room. And I see this happen all the time and they just get fired usually by when they have this attitude. But the thing they, they met, must never do is if they get footage in an editing room that they, they need to, they, they need to protect, they need to mm. come in and fix a lot of stuff, whether it's performances, whether it's camera work, whether it's, you know, what I said earlier, where the, the, cameras going everywhere and which way each take and they have to basically sit there and make sense of it. You know what? They have to pretend like it's the best footage in the world and they have to use every yeah. trick in the book to make it great because if they put together a mediocre cut or a bad cut and then everyone says, why is this a bad cut? There's no answer that works where it's like, well, the footage wasn't good. If they blame the footage, they're <laughs> right. done. Nobody wants to ha ever hear that. So, you know, you can tell, make sure yeah. that happens. Yeah, Thank you, you so much, Andrea. I'm oh, sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> um, Josh, do you Thanks. mind if we do a few more? And then maybe, I know time is running for you, so maybe we can do a few more. And can the rest of them maybe tweet you or Facebook you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, no, let's, let's, awesome. let's do a few more. I'm going to go ahead and, and unmute everybody. And then if I call on you, um, please go ahead and ask your questions. So, um, then we have, is, is Ruth here? Oh, is Ruth here? Hello. Yes. Hey, Ruth. Here. Hey, Ruth. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. How Thanks are you doing, you. John? Hey, Ruth. Hey. Um, Josh, I, I had put in a couple questions, and I've, I've asked you some before at some of the conventions, but not these. Um, you've done so many different things from the vampires to working with Josh Jackson in the, in the videos and, and everything like that. What would you say has been your most challenging episode or, or genre that you had to work with? What made it so challenging? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. Um, what is what has been the most challenging? Um, I think what's the most challenging, and and I'm actually I, I'll I won't I won't name names, um, but what's what's challenging is um, when you walk into a show, and 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 again, like we talked in this whole call about how you as a director have to be prepared to inherit uh, situations, inherit people. And a lot of times I walk into shows, well, not a lot of times, a few times I've walked into shows where the um, executive producers are all fighting with each other and then they're fighting with the studio and they're fighting with the network and everyone has a different vision of where the show should go. And the most challenging for me as a director is to do my job anyway and to basically say, okay, um, I, usually those shows end up um, kind of self-destructing and they end up getting canceled pretty quickly. But but, uh, you know, the, the concept of people who have all different visions that, that are constantly crossing each other and then I'm caught in the middle and I'm supposed to basically continue to do my job. So uh, it's, it's, it's less about a, a genre because I feel like I can tackle any genre. It's more about the people dynamics that have, have been the most challenging for me to sort of nego negotiate on certain shows that I've worked on. So uh, that would be my, my thought. Have you ever had since you inherit people have you ever tried to direct someone and like wonder why on earth is this person even acting i could do better than that 
<laughs> uh, yes, without a, we, yes, absolutely. I, 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 well, yeah. I mean, I don't know about me personally doing better, but I, I often direct uh, people that I don't have any idea why they were cast. Um, and, and and I'll tell you, a lot of times it has to do with like the, the people that really hold up the whole operation are the people who have been cast to do one line or two lines, like you know the proverbial, you know, uh, uh, would you like to order, you know, like the the waiter who who you know, God bless these wonderful people, but a lot of them are are very inexperienced actors who um, basically get these these jobs, you know, and 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 a lot of times. Um, on that level, I'm not even involved in casting them, but you know, you'll you'll have somebody who just has to do one simple thing, and it's very difficult for them to do it. Yeah. And um, so it's like I I I I hopefully I encourage anyone who even gets those one line parts or those two line parts, those three line parts, you know, be the best waiter you've ever you could ever possibly be. Treat that as if you're you're on an Oscar you know path to becoming best waiter of the year. You know, it's like it's that's that's key. You know, and it's uh, it's strange how that holds up the whole operation, um, the, the the smaller roles. And then I have my whole bag of tricks to try to turn actors who are sounding really artificial and flat into actually, you know, sounding semi-human so that we can <laughs> move on in life, you know. And then we fix what we can in the editing room and move, move forward, so. Absolutely. Very cool. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, we have Laura. Laura, can you hear us? Oh, Laura? Oh, I guess he hung up. Uh, is Rex on the line? Do we have Rex? How about Bridget? Bridget, can you hear us? Yeah, here. Hey, Bridget, how are you doing tonight? Good, good. Hi, Josh. Hey, Bridget. Um, quick question. I'm in Atlanta. Um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I really appreciate your time. Um, oh, here's sure. the thing. Um, last year I produced and wrote um two short films, and two months ago one of them won best screenplay. And I Good heard for you, you mention congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. And I heard you mention earlier that when you go out to Hollywood, um, you met with some Hollywood execs, and they said to come back when you have a feature. But it's like yeah. if you're in a budget, <laughs> if you're in a budget and you really want to get a literary agent, and it's like every time you try to submit to an agent, it says no unsolicited material. How do you get your foot in the door? Even I've been submitting to these film festivals, I'm getting accepted, but I haven't, mm-hmm. you know, met an agent, a lit- literary agent in Georgia because everything out here is basically for the actors. So when you're a right, writer, right. producer, I'm, you know, I've been yeah, no, I would have, I would have different, adv- I would have different advice. For you than I did uh, for the person earlier who, who talked about you know how to build up uh, her career as, as an as an actor because you know like yes actors should go to these to these markets but for a writer uh, especially a writer in film and television um, it is very difficult if you're not in Los Angeles or at least New yeah. York even New, even New York is tough unless you're in the theater scene um, for for writers L A is really the place to be. Um, because even though the production aspect of it takes place in different cities, um, all the writing takes place in Los Angeles as well as all the post-production. So, so it's really important to be here. Um, and in terms of getting your foot in the door with agents, yeah, I, I, I hear you. It's hard. Um, it's, I, I was just talking to somebody earlier today about this. It's, you know what it is? It's basically finding a person that knows somebody. You want to find somebody like, like a good a good uh, strategy would be, for example, to take all of the people that you uh, admire, people that you, whose careers you you would uh, like to model your life after, and uh-huh. go on to go on to IMDb Pro. It's a subscription worth paying for. Mm-hmm. Right. And then basically, I, make a mm-hmm. make a list of their of their agencies, and look at those agencies, and look at the uh, junior agents, like the ones who have the least amount of clients, or the ones who are just building up their, their, their careers, the ones who might be interested in, in developing a career like yours. And, uh, you know, I would use those, those crazy Facebook algorithms. I would use the, um, go through, see whose mutual friends, you know, you, you have, you might know somebody who, who knows somebody who, and you might find a kind of a beautiful convergence of somebody who could possibly 
walk your material into or give your material to somebody because that's the only way it gets done. You're never going to get right. anywhere with query letters or, 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 or cold calls. That, that just doesn't work. But you need one person to just mm-hmm. vouch for you as a human being and give mm-hmm. your material to somebody. That's, that's gotcha. the key. So basically it's just um, networking. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what I was told after – a hundred thousand dollars of the USC was like, hey, go out and network. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah you know. got, it. got it, got it. Thank it's you. It's so like, much. yeah, but but yeah, you bet. Thank you so much, for, uh, Bridget. Uh, we have a few more. Uh, is Tiffany on with us? Tiffany. All right, we'll do. Is Brittany Tipton on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How about uh, Karen? Karen, can you hear us? Hey. Hey, Karen. How are you? Good. Hey, Karen. How are you? Hi, Josh. How are you? I'm lovely. How are you? Pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Where, where, are you, where, are you, where are you calling from? <laughs> I'm actually in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually lovely, been right? nice today, which is, like, really weird because it's been cold lately, so. Yeah, yeah, but summertime is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We're getting back to the beachy side of things here. I'm pretty excited about that. All right, excellent. So I do have a question for you. I'm just kind of sure. listening to the whole interview and everything that's been going on. It's like, number one, got to say, huge fan of the Vampire Diaries. Um, excellent right. work. Awesome body of work. Just love all of it. Awesome, but I got to know. What's your why? What's my what? What's your why? What keeps you going? What is that? Oh, what's that my talent, why? You know? oh. Yeah, what's your why? <laughs> you know, like, I'm just, like, sitting here in awe, and I'm just like, man, like, that is legit stuff right there. And it's like you were talking about that moment where you were like, I don't know if I'm going to work again. But, like, yeah. what pulled you out? You know what I mean? Like, what's your why? What kept you going? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a great question. I mean, yeah, I touched on that earlier. Somebody, somebody went, went philosophical on me and, 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 and it's, it's, it's cool. I, uh, I think that it's a very good question. Um, I just feel like I want to leave something behind, you know, I want to leave a legacy of some sort, you know, that, um, you know, people, uh, you know, there's two things going on, I guess. It's that I, I want to make make it matter, you know, why I'm here and the life experience that I've had. I want to turn it into some kind of art that will actually potentially, like, be around for, for a while. And, you know, long after I'm gone, people might hear what I had to say and, and, and learn something or feel something or, or, you know, just be spoken to down the line, you know, the way you can walk into a a Van Gogh exhibit and go, oh my God, you know, if you feel something from this, you know, the guy from, mm. you know, f- 500 years ago, it's like, wow. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but uh, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of legacy, that's important to me. But, but I guess the other thing is just like you, um, it's, you, you really just want to be, be a, be, be someone who, has has a a constant like um the ability to to go forward in in life and to actually turn you know all the all the all the craziness and all of the the you know the the pain and the longing and the ambition and the and the 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 everything that you've ever experienced you know the idea of of going into the arts i think is is just is allowing you to have a way of 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 an outlet for, for all of that. And, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice. You have sacrificed a lot of your personal life. You sacrifice, in my case, a lot of my um, ability to be in one city in one place at one time. And it, and it's like, it's a, it's a very much a vocation in a way, like, you know, like a, a vocation for a, for a priest or a, a nun or something like that. It's like you, you commit your life to it. So um, it's a, uh, it, it, it's, it is tough. It's tough. It's tough to, to, to continue to believe in your life uh continuing to go and move forward and to and 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 then you know that sort of sense that uh, that kind of almost like I, I hate to call it narcissistic but there's that that sort of 
sense of like, okay, I, I have this illusion that what I have to say matters, you know, mm-hmm. that I have a voice that, that I feel like should be heard, you know, so that, that's also part of it. The idea of just knowing that, look, believing in yourself to say, okay, hey, my, my take on this whole thing is, is worth expressing in some way. And, and it's worth doing whatever I can to have the opportunity to keep doing it and to keep, uh, to keep uh, entertaining and to keep, uh, you know, making people feel things and to keep, um, uh, uh, you know, finding opportunities to, to try to change the world in some way for the better and leave something behind. I mean, I think it's, it, that's, that's my, that's really my why. I love that, man. That is, that's yeah. awesome. So thank you so much. Yeah. I really, I, sure. Wow. Yeah. You, yeah. Well, you, 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 <laughs> Sorry. You deep. I like <laughs> it. Yeah, like... I, I, dug, I dug deep for that one. Okay. Yeah. No, and that was, might that as was well. a fantastic <laughs> way. That was a fantastic way to end the night. Thank you so much, Karen, for the question. Thank you so much, Josh. Have a great Bet. time at the premiere tonight. Uh, before we go, Thank we you. look to get to the social media pages. For anyone who couldn't ask a question tonight, but maybe just wants to reach out to you and ask via Twitter, via Instagram. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm at the Joshua Butler on all of the above, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so T-H-E-J-O-S-H-U-A-B-U-T-L-E-R. And you can find Mixnology at M-I-X-K-N-O-W-L-E. DGY on Twitter, Instagram. You can find me at E R M A N underscore L A on Twitter and Instagram. You can find Brandon at W uh, sorry at B W A I T E S zero seven on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, thank you so much once again, Joshua. I know you have a great time at the premiere tonight. Uh, we're there Thanks, with man. you in spirit. No, it was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, for all of those listening, please join us uh, on February fifteenth for our next call, which is with the Beauty and the Beast cast director Lucy Bevan. That'll be a really great one. Um, we'll see you then.